Later in Morricone's life, he started doing a lot of tours and he'd tour Europe and he would sell out concerts and they'd sell out so fast they'd end up doing extra dates in every city in Europe and America and around the world and he'd sell them out like he was a rock star. And that was the first time when Morricone first started to accept, oh maybe this thing I've devoted my life to and been one of the best in the world at hasn't all been popcorn horseshit. Maybe it is beautiful music. Maybe it is brilliant. Very late in life, he finally shed that imposter syndrome and all that guilt and all that bullshit he felt. He seemed like he was a guy that was easy manipulated and easy guilted. Finally, in his late 70s, he shed all that and he really started to realize he was brilliant. And he believed the people because, you know, how many times can you see tens of thousands of people turning up and going absolutely fucking bananas for your music and young people before you realize, oh, I am doing something amazing here. And that really got him inspired and kicked him on to maybe not do some of his most iconic work in his last years, but one of his favorite periods of creation and being inspired and actually loving what he was doing. You know, when the location perfectly fits yeah. what someone's doing and it's that amazingness. The only other musician that's had such a big impact on my life that I can compare to Morricone is Pink Floyd, actually. Not even Pink Floyd, because they had broken up, sadly, but David Gilmour, live at Pompeii. And then, you know, the guitar music, one of my favourite Pink Floyd songs is Coming Back to Life. Where were you when I was down and broken and someone had commented on youtube you know when you see those youtube comments where you're like i wanted to write down what i was feeling but i couldn't someone else in yeah 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 perfectly. and they were like years ago gladiators were fighting for their lives on this this point and then you've got david gilmore's guitar music and it's just ethereal and otherworldly and and morricone is one of the only ones that can do that and and the thing is that there's words in coming back to life but it's about the the music there's no words in morricone stuff you know do you know great gig in the sky And they just transition together so much to me to like a lot of that stuff, like especially Ecstasy of Gold with that great singing range. I heard it and was like, this reminds me of fucking Morricone in a way. Yeah, and it's a shame using someone's vocals like an instrument it hasn't caught on or become its own little subgenre. But saying that, you know, you're talking about it's not about the words. Essentially, when you have a song or any kind of entertainment, what you're having is it's like a feeling in a bottle. Some bottles are happy, some bottles are sad, some bottles are melancholy some bottles are kind of relaxing some bottles are fucking heavy and going to the wire you can just pick it up and be like i want to feel fucking that buzzing feeling from ecstasy of gold or i want to feel the chills down my spine from the mission and the main theme from that and it is that beautiful thing where it's like you said about someone encapsulates your own thought they even encapsulate the feeling just by making a certain number of sounds in a certain way you would never have come up with yourself it's not something you can see from nature but the moment you hear it it's like you just recognize it it fits perfectly and it does something to your brain you don't really ever get bored of music like certain music you can do but really beautiful amazing music you never truly get bored of it and that feeling can always be tapped into and that's what morricone is the best at jill's theme in once upon a time in the west you know when you've got a theme that perfectly encapsulates a character like jill she's really been through a rough ride this whole film It's used quite sparingly in the film, but right at the end, in the last sequences, Leone pans out and you see like the railways being built and stuff like that. It's one of my favourite, favourite Ennio Morricone pieces. What an ending to a film, really. You know, the whole film is about the end of the West. You know, the railways arriving. She's lost her husband, but she's survived this whole thing. She's got through it with her wits. You know, she's going to do the plan that this guy had to build a town here and it's kind of about the end of the Old West, the end of that simplicity of life, the arriving of civilization with the railway and the coming of, you know, the modern independent woman that's going to be able to do things in the modern world. And it all comes together to perfectly 
encapsulate the ending and it's just that beautiful music if you could somehow make nostalgia a sound that is what it is it's that perfect beautiful sound and it just sums up like i feel like whenever leona used to learn about the old west or watch old western movies that was what was playing in his mind and his heart like that perfectly just encapsulates what the film's about don't you want it to be the the song at your funeral yeah no, that's I how much you to. love it because <laughs> it's just beautiful and it, i feel like it's the perfect thing to play at a funeral as well because it, it moves you not just in a sad way necessarily it, it nearly just moves you in a way where any emotions will bubble up whether you're going to feel happy or rejoiceful in the moment or whether you're going to feel sad and you i remember when a friend of ours died and wasn't crying about it for the first few days i was more just shell-shocked and my brother played a part in glass that beautiful song iris song on purpose just to basically without telling me just to nearly like poke a needle and get the get the emotions flowing and i feel like this is a perfect piece of music for that in any direction whatever you might be feeling it just stirs you up and it's just beautiful i just love it we've we've often talked about once upon a time in the west i i kind of go up and down about my favorite one i do settle on once upon a time in the west a, a study of the west as a whole rather than the full-on action sequences of like good the bad and the ugly so i see i, I don't like know it. if you have to get intellectual with it you know my thoughts on it. it's my favorite film ever made and i honestly believe the greatest film ever made i just think you don't need to get deeply intellectual about it for me it is just the best storytelling the best directing it's leone and morricone at their absolute peak of their powers it is perfect So I wanted to pick Frantic because it's it's one of those films where, like you said before, Morricone scored a lot of these sort of Italian crime thriller sort of movies, but he didn't do a whole lot of Hollywood ones. Frantic, you know, it's a Roman Polanski film. Harrison Ford in his pomp forever in every film searching for his wife. And this is the ultimate Harrison Ford searches for his wife film there is. And the score throughout is brilliant. But there's something about like this car chase scene. Morricone's music, it doesn't just complement a scene or suit a scene or suit the pace of action on what's happening. There's something about the notes and the particular sounds. If you close your eyes and just heard that, you feel like you should be watching a car chase. That's what it feels like. And it's jazzy and weird. It's, it's kind of got this weird intoxicating feel. And a lot of this film is about seedy underground in Paris and criminal underworld and getting slipping into it and lust. And he's searching for his wife, but he's kind of like, you know, fancying this cool French bird that he's hanging out with the whole film. The score perfectly sets you into that daze that Harrison Ford's character must be in right now. I will be honest. I've never actually seen this film. Have not, you not? Nor heard of it, actually. Mate. It is a, cl you've got to see Frantic. It's, you know, the Bare Naked Lady songs, like Harrison Ford, I'm Getting Frantic. Oh, da, da, yeah, da, da, yeah, da, yeah, That's yeah. what it's about. I didn't need to know that he was, because straight away, the first few notes, I could tell it was him, even though it was different. Do you know what I mean? Like that whole, like, you know, kind of like the hate weight, the opening, like, you can tell straight away. Tarantino Kill Bill, where the bride, Uma Thurman, is buried alive. I didn't know about it was used in another film before. Um, I knew it was Ennio Morricone, you can tell straight away, but this was perfectly used by Tarantino. She's in a life or death situation. She's like punching through the coffin, like one-handed, and I love the build-up to it. It just, it just comes in, and she sort of like says to herself, you know, I'm in a bad situation, but I'm a strong-willed person. Slowly punching through, and it just builds and it builds and it builds the crescendo till she finally breaks through. And I love it when she refers to like the trainer, like, This is for you, like, bang, bang. And then you see the blood like coming, and the earth washing down as she breaks through, you know what I mean? And it perfectly, perfectly used by Tarantino. What, what a piece to go over this scene. what is on paper a very simple scene in terms of what happens 
and how much music can change that and visualize that scene right now without the music probably wouldn't be particularly exciting but the music punctuates it and to be honest if you film that scene without the music you'd probably make it half the time and quick cut it a bit because you can't linger that long the music combines and it helps you to get to the emotion you're supposed to be getting to and helps deliver a very implausible scene the music carries the plausibility because it stirs the emotion up in you and once emotion stirred up logic goes out the window The harmonica theme used for the final duel. Beautiful score, but also it's amazing because it kind of pieces together all three main styles of music Morricone was making for spaghetti westerns during this period. You know, you have the melody theme that comes in in the final act of the song. You have the guitar riffs and kind of unconventional things for a composer of the time. And you have the opening, which is purely the harmonica. Not only an instrument to be used in the theme, but also plays into something about a character and something that's actual a physical object in the film. He carries a harmonica around. It has, as we find out, a real relevancy to something that's happened in the past and to why the character is here and seeking revenge. The way he mixes in something that's diegetic sound within the plot of the film into the musical theme that then is played. If you were studying Morricone's music making for Spaghetti Westerns, it's kind of nearly like the perfect one to study because it's all in there. But it's so perfect for this moment because it's like we, we've spoken about how this whole gunfight probably takes place over 20, 30 seconds. But we see it over eight minutes. If someone's getting the eyes in their sun, they spend a good three, 30, 40 seconds doing. If they're walking to find a good base in order to have the shootout, that's a two, three minutes with beautiful music playing out. But the whole piece plays out in its entirety, then stops then plays out again in its entirety as we go into the flashback and we see what happened to Harmonica Man. And, and it's beautiful as well because the shootout happens at the very end of the flashback and it's done in a second. And the violence is literally done in a blink of an eye, but the actual emotion is explored over like eight minutes when probably the whole thing took 30 seconds. And the music is the vehicle that we travel in. Even in the final seconds, he puts the harmonica in Frank's mouth as he's dying and his final breaths are played through the harmonica and we get the creaky sort of sounds and the music was becoming as important as the writing or the directing and the filmmaking. It was all informing each other. Throughout this eight minute sequence, I think there's four lines of dialogue. We don't need dialogue. We don't need anything else. It is the music that, that creates this atmosphere, that creates this scene. The music, as you said, creates a whole life in an eight minute sequence, a whole life's worth of events. And and that's how powerful Morricone's music, music is. Well, the character himself, he speaks far less dialogue than he plays tunes on the harmonica. And that is what you more remember about his character. And it becomes not a particular line, but a sound and a tune that is etched into your brain for eternity. Cinema Paradiso, what a film. A film made essentially for the love of cinema. A boy that starts off working in a cinema and then comes back many years later when his mentor has sadly passed away back to the cinema that is derelict and run down with a piece of film, a showreel that accumulates his life's work, puts it back on the screen. You said about nostalgia, this is nostalgia in a scene. There's no one else in this cinema apart from him, the big screen, and then he owes mo music as we see it pan into his face and, you know, the tears rolling down. It's just such a fucking brilliant emotional scene. It's, it's just heartwarming and excellent. He scored over 500 films, but this is the one that is about nostalgia and love of film. I can't say anything is perfect because you can't call anything perfect, but it's near on perfect cinema <laughs> all, all together. And that's what the film's trying to be. So it, it's excellent, excellent. What do we do? Wait here for a little while, see what happens.
any Amorikoni score in the thing is brilliant because he didn't do a lot of horror films. He did work with um, Argento quite a bit. A horror in general and building tension, even just without music, sound is such a brilliant, easy tool to build tension and create things like that. But what's great about this score is there's a real simplicity to it and it, it wouldn't even necessarily strike you as a horror score. What he captures so perfectly, and you really see it in the final sequence especially, after the whole camp has gone up on fire and McCready is just lying there, he knows he's going to die, but the other character shows up who he thought he had died and they start to suspect each other. It's nearly like just wails of music comes in and it's, and that sort of ominous tone and it's when that repetitive beat comes in, the dong. Dun, 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 that started the film off. It's so simple, it's such a simple tune, but it creates such an ominous feeling. And, and as the credits roll and it's an ambiguous ending and, and you feel like this, the beat's going to drop, you feel like something's going to happen, but it just keeps playing that same tune over and over again. His genius and talent, he could, he could score for any genre. Whatever he's doing for a scene or whatever it's supposed to convey in the moment, it's never quite what you think he's going to do. Sometimes it's an action scene and he plays some sort of melody, but it works and you just, he's always right, but it's always an unusual choice. Gabriel's Oboe, such a beautiful piece of music. And it's one of those things where it sounds so simple. That tune was always out there. It always existed. Morricone essentially just unearthed it. And presented it but how did no one ever come across it before do you know what i mean it's such a simple tune it's so beautiful but then somehow so unique and distinct and it's brilliant because in you know in this scene jeremy piven's come into the jungle they make a point of really playing up the diegetic sound effects of the jungle and all the different sounds and when he pulls out his oboe he's not trying to conquer the jungle conquer the native He's speaking a universal language and he starts playing the chimes and it nearly calls him out like Pied Piper. He like calls him out from the jungle. Music is like a sound feeling and the feeling is all the same. So when he plays the notes, it doesn't matter if they've never seen the instrument before, never heard that particular sound before. It hits whatever thing it stirs in you, it stirs in them as well. In the script or in the story, this is the moment where two cultures connect mm. emotionally connect and un get an understanding so that has to be a fucking world beater when you're writing the score for the whole film whatever you're coming up from that bit has to be the best bit of the whole film and it might be his most beautiful piece of music he ever made yeah from talking about that he didn't want to score it to scoring it and being one of the most beautiful pieces ever done the director talking about it where they had the screening he said i was looking around for Eddie morricone when this scene was playing and i couldn't see him and i realized that he had slid down in his seat and when he turned around he was crying you know i hear gabriel's oboe and it, and it still moves me to this day like every single time and it's just f amazing It's an orchestra the Jesuits could have subdued the whole continent. So it was that the Indians of the Guarani were brought finally to account to the everlasting mercy of God and to the short-lived mercy of man. Ecstasy of Gold. How can I even start? I think probably, personally, my favourite Ennio Morricone piece. Massive in popular culture to this day. You, you turn on a fucking advert for Dior Sauvage and they've remixed it into a dance piece. But I love this scene. It, it, it starts off with Tuco running like frantically trying to find the gold and you can hear it just slowly, slowly building up to the last crescendo. It's called the ecstasy of gold, and it is ecstasy in a piece of music, and it and what a name for for the song. It's just everything together. The 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 voice of the the operatic voice of the ha oh, ha oh, oh, the piano music playing frantically. Like I think Gabriel's oboe is up there, but for me, like the most accomplished piece of Ennio's music, and it perfectly goes together with everything that's happening on the screen. The franticness, the ecstasy of trying to find money because at the end of the day if anyone like if you used to walk out and find a million pounds on the floor i'd want this piece of music to be playing as i as i picked it up so what a piece of music really you made a great point about the name because it is the perfect name for it and one thing morricone is underrated at is naming his music as well like some of them like silhouette of doom is that not the greatest name for anything you've yeah, ever heard? yeah how cool is that 
But also, it's one of those things where, you know, you get pieces of music that are written as a main theme, and maybe it's the action theme, and whenever there's action going on, you know, it pops up a lot. And pretty much every other piece of music in the film features, or at least a version of it, maybe an abridged version or a slightly more restrained version, pops up at different times. But to write a piece of music this amazing and have the discipline to say, no, it was written for this one moment Mm -hmm. and this one sequence and it's perfect for that. That's it. I remember watching it for the first time as a kid in Ireland, which always makes films better because there's nothing else to do. It was before internet and phones and stuff. So you're just stuck there. You know, you're two hours into this film and then it gets to that scene and you think it can't go up another gear and it just does. So you're seeing perfection before you were the first two hours and thinking... You can't improve on perfection. Yes, you can. <laughs> and it's the beauty of cinema. It kind of reminds me of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. You know the amazing 10-minute fight sequence at the very end? Epic, long, beautiful to watch, elegant, crazy at points. So well pho- photographed. It's amazing. In the script, it just said they fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd imagine in the script for this, it said, Tuco runs around the graveyard looking for Arch Stanton. That becomes this four minute incredible memorable scene. So for a few dollars more, the last jewel, the chimes in this, the ding, 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 with the watch. It's been building up to this moment the whole time. They're in a Mexican standoff and he says, when this finished playing, you're gonna die. Unfair set up, he's just gonna kill him. He hasn't even got his gun, old angel eyes. And it's getting to the end, you're sitting there as the audience member thinking, Please, he's gonna kill him, don't let it get to the end. There's no way out of this. Just, just as it's about to end, we hear din, 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 starting again. And it's old Clint Eastwood with his watch, angel eyes looking on his body. He's taking it, thinking, Fuck, fuck. And it just like, it's the perfect tension and excellent filmmaking. And then you see him giving his gun and this one of my favourite, favourite bits in cinema. Now we start. (laughs) And I'm just sitting, oh fucking, when I first saw it, I was clapping. I nearly feel like Morricone, he was so full of ideas and invention. He couldn't help but innovate and just get better. The fact that he would always find a way to incorporate something from the plot into the music and and therefore it was integral to the plot and it was just it was just an amazing scene so we, we get on to now another one of tarantino's crazy escavated films this time in glorious bastards the bear Jew scene what i liked about it declan is he knows he's facing certain death the commander brad pitt's character is saying if you don't tell us this information you know who the bear Jew is. They're like, the bear Jew's this guy that comes out with a baseball bat and caves people's heads in. And he just refused to tell him the information and he died. Like it's, it's one of the most courageous things, even though I'm not rooting for the Nazis, that I've seen in a scene. Like, he knows he's about to get fucking hit. And what, what is great about this scene is you hear him. You don't see him. You hear the bear Jew in the tunnel, like scraping the baseball bat along the walls. And it's a great build up of tension. And along with that tension, you got the rise in Ennio Morricone piece as he emerges to like a crescendo of like, blah, blah. <laughs> and it's just fantastic. And again, a guy just walking out of a tunnel. Guy walking out of a tunnel. But it takes it time. It slows the moment down and it really gets you into the feeling of it and it just explores every aspect of it. Another great use in in, in Glorious Bastards is from Ennio Morricone's score that he composed for the Battle of Algiers. Where it's that kind of, it nearly sounds like a, a typewriter. Ding, 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 da, 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 da. It's got that sort of thing going on. And it's when they're getting broken out of prison. The staging is very unrealistic because you have the German guy in his cell, the bastards kind of walk into view one by one in different ways. Staging wise, if you saw someone actually all enter a room like that, you'd be like, what are you doing? Why are you, did you choreograph this beforehand? Like, what the fuck's going on? But with the music, it makes it plausible. It makes it make sense in a weird poetic sense. Like that for me encapsulates what a Tarantino film is supposed to make you feel like. It's that charm and fun of the perfect moment 
the perfect dialogue, the perfect action, the perfect movement, the perfect framing of the camera blended with the perfect music just to put a smile on your face. Incidentally, you know the Bear Duke was originally supposed to be played by Adam Sandler? Mm -hmm. That would have been fucking great. Yeah, that would have been, for that would have worked actually, yeah. That would have been fantastic. Some films today, seeing some films today, if NEO was still alive, have you seen any films today that you you thought would have like suited his music? I was watching Uncut Gems and I would have, I thought, you know what, Ennio could have scored a fucking score for this. That would have That's a really worked, interesting actually. one. I gotta say. Yeah. Last one I want to talk about actually. Deborah's theme. There's a scene in Once Upon a Time in America where they use it, where it's just a perfect sort of Leone-ish moment. Someone who loves Leone's directing style and the way he puts a film together. It's just a great scene to watch, even in isolation without watching the whole film, where it's when Noodles first shows back up and he gets in contact with Big Mo. But you don't know that yet. You're just looking through the window of Big Mo's diner. The camera's panning back and forth, but we're seeing it all from the outside and we're not really hearing any diegetic sound effects or anything. And we can't hear him speaking because it's through a window. But you see him, he's working and whatever. And then the camera pans up and the music's starting to build. He gets a phone call and he suddenly looks shocked and he rushes everyone out. And it's an interesting thing where you're not hearing any sound. You're getting all the music and the music is like building and it's beautiful and amazing. But because you don't have context of what's happening and you don't have any sound. So you're just look. it's nearly like silent movie acting. You're just getting his performance in like its purest form accompanied with the music. And then it gets to that crescendo as the camera pans down and we see Robert De Niro. We can't hear him, even though it's a close-up, but he's speaking on the phone. And it's that sort of nostalgia and they go in and they see each other again. Sometimes I feel like people think there needs to be a reason for something. Why is a beautiful piece of music beautiful? You don't need to intellectualize it. It's just beautiful. You can get into like the theory and the writing and the technicality of it if you understand that stuff. But you don't need to. It's just beautiful. And sometimes it's like, why did Leone direct the scene in that way and have the music play over it? Didn't need to do it. He could just show Noodle shows up and he calls him. But it's because they found something that not just suited that moment in the film, but it was just a beautiful way of doing it. And once again, Morricone's music is essential to that. And it was just a perfect, perfect use of a beautiful piece of music. Yeah, and I'll just finish on another scene from Once Upon a Time in America. You know the scene where the little boy is running, he's like, he's coming, and then he, they boop, 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 boop. yeah, they shoot him. And like, this is what I loved. He said, Leone said to Morricone, we're going to put this piece over. This is how we're going to frame it. You know, with the ham, with the blood on it. Mm. And it just perfectly summed up their work and relationship, the, the togetherness they had. And I'm just so grateful they met. And for fans of both the director and the maestro himself, I'm just so grateful we got to see their work on the screen. Well, that brings me up to another point about Leone. As much as we love Leone, I think he was a cunt. He was a bit of a bastard. <laughs> yeah, because maybe not a full on cunt. Kubrick knew that Morricone was doing work on a fistful of dynamite. Kubrick approached Leone and was like, I really want Morricone to work on a Clockwork Orange. But Leone turned around and was like, nah, he can't. He's doing work on a fistful of dynamite. He lied and said he's still composing, yeah. when in actual fact, he was mixing it, all the work was done, and he absolutely could have worked on it, which was really out of order bang out of order because i'm sitting here as fans like why didn't you allow that you bastard? honestly like... you phil text me this during the week if i'd been sitting in a chair i would have fallen out the back of it because one of my favorite films of all time a clockwork orange and as beautiful and perfect as the music for that is i need to find that parallel of universe or find a portal into it so i can see what the morricone version would have been like it's really annoying because you know like we've covered loads of films where there's like alternate endings and stuff and you're like ah oh, actually the, the alternate endings was better and they didn't use it imagine if we could have seen that he'd done something for it but it never got out and it might not have even been better and it probably would have been a different film altogether in some ways but fuck me you're just you just think like what would that have been like we got the privilege to go and see Ennio Morricone live like me you and my dad Maybe years down the line when my dad isn't here and I hear any of those pieces, I know that I'll get emotional because mm -hmm. I'm getting it now. So, like, there is something about music or something about film that can do it when it's a time or place that transports you. No other thing can do that. Like, and that's why I love it so much. Yeah. On the subject of going to see any of live to be able to see with you who's you know my best friend one of my best friends i can say that and my dad i'll never forget that 
I, I didn't actually know Declan. I was just constantly Googling Ennio Morricone live, Ennio Morricone live. And it finally came up. And I didn't give a fuck if the tickets were 10,000. Well, I would have, obviously. But you get my point. I knew straight away, like, even before I phoned you. Like, I was phoning you all excited and running down to my dad going, Oh, Ennio Morricone's live. And he's old now. And I was, like, all excited. Like, he's old. And we'll never, like... Do you know when, like, the, you could see, like, the Rolling Stones live or something? You may never get a chance again i just had to do it i just had to do it it was brilliant as well because you get to see it with you because pretty much not our first conversation but our first conversation when we actually became friends back when we were kids and we started talking about morricone how much we loved his music and we both said we got to go see him live if we ever get the chance one day literally our first bonding conversation we ever had and to finally get to see him live on his final tour I think just what the year before he died yeah. I nearly didn't believe that we were actually were getting to do it because it kind of he got older and he wasn't touring and it just became this thing that wasn't going to happen and it did happen and it was just as brilliant as I thought it was going to be and one of the best things about it was he didn't even necessarily do all his pieces of music that I wanted and he did a couple that I didn't always rate or wasn't in the highest on my list but I got a new love for those songs it was partly because you could see how much he loved doing it and it was mad like it never occurred to me that he must love this music as well and seeing him performing it and getting into it and the encore and when you love something that's not you know lit it's not obscure but it's kind of obscure suddenly for the first time ever being in a room of thousands of people that love this obscure thing just as much as you do and actually seeing the person perform it live and hearing a real orchestra do it it was just fucking everything it was meant to be to see something that you have such a connection with especially music and do with that for you like remember when we went to see the eagles and you just wouldn't stop singing desperado i was a the bit drunk as the well. woman next to you was like please please I'm trying I, I, to I was the cunt that ruins it for everyone at that particular one but it's like i'm so grateful to have had the chance to see that because that really was you know as you said Declan. It's something that we've been talking about for years and I've talked about with my dad for years and getting to a point in my life where, you know, I'm not going to say it on here, but I've got through one stage of my life where I had something that I was connected to that I don't need anymore. And now I'm seeing other things that I want to do that I've got out of that darkness and that hole. And that was one of them. That was on my bucket list to see Morricone live. There was three things on my film bucket list of life. I've done one of them now, seeing any Morricone. I have to, before I die, go to the set in Italy, those Western sets. Yeah, I must, we must go 100%. to do that. 100%. One down, two to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the good thing about seeing it live, you build something up so much and then you go and then you come away and now I feel a bit disappointed about it. I didn't get that at all, yeah. really. And and that's testament to the maestro himself, Morricone. Yeah.